Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. I'm Maldika Jain and I have with me the Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Shakti Kanta Das. Dr. Das, welcome to CNBC TV 18. Thank you. First and foremost, congratulations to you for being recognized as the top governor by Global Finance for the second time. What are the top achievements during the course of your tenure as a Reserve Bank of India governor? I think uh, the major achievement of the Reserve Bank of India has been, number one, navigating through this period of crisis of multiple shocks, the COVID uh, pandemic followed by the war in Ukraine, in the aftermath of that, the synchronized monetary policy tightening. So multiple shocks the Reserve Bank has navigated with, I would say, a reasonable amount of uh, success. Secondly, I think uh, we have been able to maintain financial stability in our uh, financial system. I think that's a major, that's the foremost achievement which we have done. And third, I think in the area of technology, in the area of uh, adoption of technology into central banking, into payment systems, I think by and large, these would be the three major uh, achievements over the Reserve Bank of India over the last uh, five to six years or so. So you have mentioned um, before that the coordination between the government and the central bank has facilitated and enabled the economy to grow despite the various challenges that the world has faced. You have a unique background. You have served as a finance secretary and now you're the governor of the Reserve Bank of India. How much do you attribute the success of the initiative that the RBI has taken under your regime to your unique background? You see, it's like this. Uh, when you have worked in the you know finance ministry earlier and for a, quite a long time, and then you come to Central Bank, so you have an understanding of uh, the requirements and uh, the approaches of both the sides. And these are not necessarily conflicting sides. Each, that is the government and the Reserve Bank, that is the central bank, they have their assigned roles in the economy. Because I was earlier in the finance ministry, I do have a you know good understanding of uh, sure. what are the expectations that side. And now that I am in the, you know, now that for the last several years I have been in the Reserve Bank, I get to know what is the perspective of the central bank. So basically going forward while navigating a period of crisis, you know how to balance uh, the objective of growth, which is the objective of the government, and the objective of price stability, which is the mandated responsibility of uh, the Reserve Bank. I think these two agencies, the government and the Reserve Bank, they need each other for the success of the economy and for the economy to perform in an optimal manner. And uh, there is therefore need for always a uh, uh, good amount of coordination there may be differences of opinion, but there is need for good coordination. So the global environment continues to be volatile. Does it mean that you might get a term extension? I mean, given your a wonderful track record. Well, uh, you know, I will tell you very I honestly. I have been asked this many times. I have been asked this many times. Even yesterday I was asked this question. But I will tell you, uh, I have still a few days, you know, a few weeks to go. And at the moment, I am just focused on my work and what is on my table. So beyond that, I don't, uh, you know, I don't uh, think or that's not something which uh, distracts me. Sir, in terms of work, your hands are full. Uh, you know, the festive season commentary that has come in from companies across sectors, be it FMCG, auto, etc. There, there is a softening of the de in the demand environment that we're witnessing. Economists polled by CNBC TV18 also believe uh, that they may have to uh, revise the growth forecast uh, downwards. The recently concluded MCP, though, was optim optimistic about growth. Do you have any concerns considering uh, the commentary from the companies? You see, I don't want to, you know, sort of, uh, I'm not in the game of one-up manship. Sure. But last year, in all seriousness, when we projected uh, higher growth, I think the opinion outside was that RTI was being too optimistic. But ultimately, the growth number which came was even higher than what we had uh, projected. Today, as I'm talking to you, in all seriousness, you see, there are some mixed signals. The festival season, the first quarter, you know, the growth rate was lower, lower than what we had expected. Second quarter numbers will come only at the end of November. Second quarter also, there were some unseasonal rains in the month of August, etc. Some activities got uh, affected. But even in the festive season, there is some narrative that perhaps the sales figures and certain things have... Uh, slowed down. But what I would like to emphasize is that there are mixed signals. There are pluses. There are, you know, there are some positives. There are some negatives. But I think the positives significantly outweigh the negatives. The so-called, I'll just complete. 
the so called slow down in certain areas that has been significant that is getting you know that is outweighed by the kind of positives that we are getting and if i can just take a minute or you see agriculture sector is doing exceedingly well this year thanks to a very good monsoon the expectation on rabi crop is very good rural demand has now revived that is one area which was languishing for a long time even the first quarter gdp number this year at 6.7 which was lower than our estimate of 7.1 even there the consumption demand has shown significant revival i think if i remember correctly it was about 7.4 or 7.5 something in that region and even now also there are many high frequency indicators you know like for example domestic air passenger traffic the two wheeler sales and there are several uh, high speed indicators which are uh, uh, sort of which are exhibiting a very uh, robust growth the you know the e-commerce in the tier 2 tier tier 3 cities are showing good uh, numbers the you know so therefore there are substantial amount of high frequency indicators which indicate that uh, the economy is doing reasonably well and therefore and let's also flag but the, what are the risk factors let's also say that let's also recollect and uh, i would like to mention that the imf 3 days ago has projected india's growth at uh, 7% sorry i took a long time for that no i i just wanted to know what are the risk factors you see with regard to the risk factors it's like this first the global uh, geopolitical conditions continue to be highly uncertain there appears to be escalation of the crisis in various uh, affronts in the entire uh, global geopolitical scenario it's getting uh, sometimes accentuated day by day so that is a major risk the geoeconomic fragmentation that is the supply chain bottlenecks and the logistics uh, impediments etc that also continues and uh, on top of that uh, volatile you know volatile uh, commodity prices in fact the latest round of uh, you know there is some increase in commodity prices but that will play a major role in uh, the inflation side the coming to growth it is the geopolitical continuing geopolitical crisis the geoeconomic fragmentation and any extreme weather event which can have an impact on the external demand and so therefore uh, that can you know that is a risk factor to india but by and large again india has always been you know the growth in india has always been sustained by our domestic demand and domestic investment both of which are uh, you know quite uh, quite uh, i think they are quite uh, robust at the moment so that brings me to two questions on um... the impact of some weather changes climate change has been at the top of the agenda you recently participated in uh, the imf world bank annual meetings what steps is the rbi taking to integrate uh, climate risks into financial planning whether it's some kind of guidance to the banks or uh, to the entire financial system as a whole you see on climate uh, on the climate related measures it's the government which is in the forefront and let me also but you also add, came yeah, out with the draft yeah, i'll just mention but let me also add that you know among the g20 countries india is the best performing g20 country with regard to implementation of its climate related uh, uh, commitments coming to the central bank you know we have taken number of measures we have uh, set up a, you know we have set up a green uh, finance group within the reserve bank of india we have now launched green bonds sovereign green bonds we have issued guidelines for regulatory guidelines for green deposits and we have come out with several uh, you know you, what you are referring to a discussion paper on uh, you know assessment of climate risk and risk mitigation now based on that discussion paper we will we would like to take it forward and issue certain guidelines for banks and other financial entities particularly the lenders to assess their risks in various scenarios of uh, you know in various scenarios hypothetical scenarios of uh, intensity of uh, climate another thing that you talked about and is obviously at the top of rbi's agenda is inflation control you have indicated time and again that until and unless uh, we see uh, inflation in the four, round over 4% region a rate cut is completely ruled out if we continue to see growth as you are expecting that the momentum will continue so do we assume that rate cuts would not happen inflation management price stability is our primary responsibility keeping in mind the objective of at the moment as we stated in the last monetary policy statement as i have said the growth and inflation component of our mandates are well balanced they are well poised that so therefore we changed our stance to neutral now we have flexibility we have now flexibility to watch the incoming trends 
and to sort of assess the evolving outlook and decide on what policy we will take. Now, growth is doing well. Inflation also has started moderating and we expect the inflation to moderate as we go into December, November, December and into the last quarter, last quarter of this financial year. We expect the inflation to moderate, but then there are significant risks. I have stated it in my monetary policy. Right. Significant risks, again, arising out of geopolitical conflicts, out of geoeconomic fragmentation, weather-related events, and, you know, certain data which was released by the FAO with regard to food commodities and by the World Bank with regard to certain, uh, certain commodities like metal prices and all. They have shown quite a bit of uptake. So, therefore, there are significant risks to the inflation outlook. We expect and we are reasonably confident that inflation is moderating, but then there are significant risks. So we have to be very careful. And we are in such a place, you know, such a position where growth and inflation is so sort of well balanced that any premature move can upset that balance and, uh, you know, can affect uh, our objective of uh, achieving an inflation to reach the target of 4% or go close to 4% target. So, sir, if I could summarize that, uh, you feel that the growth momentum will continue and inflation is likely to come down. That's right. And until and unless there are some external factors which are beyond uh, the control of the domestic economy, we could see a rate cut in the coming year. No, rate cut, when it will come, I would not like to cut. <laughs> okay. I think that will give away. And again, in all seriousness, I think it depends on the incoming data. And based on the incoming data, the, what kind of assessment, what kind of outlook? Because inflation, uh, you know, policy, monetary policy making is always forward looking. Right. We have to see what is the situation six months down the line, down the road. What is the situation one year down the road? So based on that, we, you know, we determine and decide the future outlook. So based on that assessment, we will take a decision. I cannot give as to when we will do a rate sure. cut or Understand. Uh, we will not do a rate cut. I cannot say. We expect inflation to moderate. We have to be very careful. We have to be very watchful of the evolving outlook. And we should not do, as I said again, I'm repeating, we should not do anything in a haste, which uh, will sort of again put us back in our objective of achieving the inflation target. In fact, it's interestingly, the household, uh, you know, the inflation expectations of households are also well anchored okay. at the moment because the household inflation expectations are, you know, moderating for almost uh, every round of survey. The household expectations are moderating by 10 or 20 basis points for the last uh, two years. So we are therefore very, we are very, uh, we are maintaining constant visit. We are watchful. We have to evaluate the risks and see how the risks are playing out. And based on that, when we have greater confidence of the inflation aligning with the target, that would be a time where we, you know, we will see. Sure. So moving away from this discussion around inflation and growth, I wanted to ask you about actions against NVFCs. Typically, uh, in the recent past, you know, you tilted towards imposing severe business restrictions on lenders instead of levying fines. Do you think there is a systemic risk concern here? No, there is no systemic risk. In fact, I would like to emphasize that at the moment, at the system level, the banking sector and the NBFC sector, at the system level, they remain very robust. The various parameters, the regulatory parameters, the various uh, you know financial indicators of both banking and NBFC sector, they continue to be very strong. So at the systemic level, there is no problem. But where we saw the problem was in the microfinance sector. You see, in 2022, we came out with new guidelines relating to microfinance lending. Earlier, the principle was that cost of funds, the interest rate, was supposed to be the cost of funds plus 12% margin, which the you know, MFI, the microfinance lenders were allowed to charge as interest rates. We deregulated that in 2022 because this 12% margin was becoming kind of a benchmark for everyone. Sure. We deregulated that and we expected that competition will result in optimization of the interest rates for the benefit of the borrowers. And who are the microfinance borrowers? Well, basically the small borrowers, you know, people who do not have work, who are not economically very well off. So therefore, we did that deregulation on the expectation that competition will lead to better, you know, sort of lead to uh, reasonable interest rates for the clientele. Now, unfortunately, that has not happened. 
we have been constantly voicing the Reserve Bank, myself, my colleagues, on a number of occasions, we have been voicing our concern. In fact, even in the last monetary policy statement, I have also mentioned that. Now, what happened is that we, uh, what happened was that in our on-site uh, and off-site supervision, we found, uh, uh, you know, a number of NBFCs charging exorbitant interest rates. Right. Interest rates going up to 40%, going up to 45%. Oh. Now, and who is the borrower? The borrower is a, you know, he is a man of small means. Right. And these are not well-off uh, sections of uh, society. And a 40-45% interest rate or even 25% is a lot. I, I don't want your viewers to assume that if I say 35-35 is the tolerable limit. I don't, I'm just using it by way of a random example. Now, such excessive interest rates are usurious. And apart from that, some of the charges, like for example, a few days of delay in repayment, the penalties are uh, exorbitant and sometimes the penalties are not uh, you know adequately transparent so therefore whatever measure we have taken it's in the best interest of the customer we found certain outliers and even in these outlier you know cases we have where we have taken action we have been in bilateral engagement with each of them for last uh, so several these... months now when we see that appropriate corrective action is not taken we engage first and when we see after several months of engagement that corrective action is not being taken to our satisfaction, then we have to act and protect the interest of the consumers, of the customers. Sure. And then banks uh, have been reporting increased stress in uh, unsecured uh, retail loans. The RBI has raised risk weights in this segment last year as a warning. Does this remain a concern for you? No, I think after we introduced those uh, additional risk weights, etc. in November last year, the segments where we impose these additional uh, restrict, you know, the additional, uh, you know, we impose certain additional regulatory compliance requirements, the provisioning requirements. In those sectors, we have seen the, you know, we have seen moderation in credit growth. So that has happened. There are, uh, with regard to other sectors, we are closely monitoring every aspect of the credit market, every subsector of the credit market we are monitoring. As and when something is required, we will act and we will take uh, preemptive action before the problems uh, start building up. RBI's draft proposal on liquidity convergence uh, norms has been in the public domain for a while. Banks have expressed concerns about the potential impact on capital and by extension on credit growth. Uh, is there a possibility of some kind of softening of your stance on you this see, issue? We have adopted in the formulation of regulations, we have adopted a very consultative approach. And that is the purpose of putting this discussion paper to get comments of the stakeholders to take that into consideration, examine that, and then come out with our guidelines. We have received a number of uh, uh, suggestions. And from what the are banks, the suggestions? Banks from, uh, you know, the uh, Indian Banks Association. We have got a number of suggestions. Naturally, would you like to like, share what they no, are? I mean, there the, you know, quite a few, I mean, number of suggestions. So, naturally, they would like, uh, some of them, they want uh, this not to be done at the moment. Some of them want a longer period, you know, longer uh, phasing out the entire uh, thing. One point I would like to emphasize is that the discussion paper has arisen from certain potential risks which we see in the economy in today's age of digital banking, online banking where withdrawal of money from the bank accounts can just happen in, you know, seconds. Second. We saw some of it happening in February 2000, uh, you know, early 2023 in the United States where, set us, you know, a few banks came under stress. Our effort is to Second. mitigate uh, those risks. And it is being done in the interest of financial stability. But we will take into consideration the comments of the banks and other stakeholders and we'll decide about it. So that is further talk of interna internationalization of the rupee. Uh, where do you see that going? Um, particularly, you know, Donald Trump, we are in the U.S., a presidential candidate from the Republican Party has indicated that if there is de-dollarization, any country that moves away from the dollar is going to impose 100% tariffs. Uh, in such a scenario, how do you balance uh, trade relationships with countries like the U.S. and also ensure that uh, the RBI's agenda, the government's agenda of internationalization of the rupee countries. You see, internationalization of the rupee should not be equated with an intention for de-dollarization. Both are different things. 
when we are talking of internationalization of the rupee, what basically we mean to, what we mean is that in bilateral trade uh, settlements between India and another country, a major trading partner of India, our idea is to use rupee as a medium of settlement or the local currency as a mode of settlement. But right now, mostly dollar is used. So it what is dollar is dollarization. We have, for example, with the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, we have signed an agreement for the local currency settlement of uh, trade, uh, you know, trade settlements to happen through uh, local currency. So importers and exporters on either side, they can do the settlement either by using the Indian rupee or by using the dirham or they have the freedom to use the dollar. So therefore, when you are doing a settlement bilaterally with your trading partner by using the rupee or by using the local currency of both the countries, you are basically, it's a move towards de-risking your trade because the entire global uh, trade being based on one single currency can lead to concentration risks. If there are wild uh, fluctuations in that particular currency, the rest of the world will have to face the volatility emanating from that. So this is a kind of a insurance, this is a kind of a de-risking your trade from the fluctuations or the volatility of uh, the dollar in certain situations. And it is a flexibility which has been given to the traders on either side. It is not in competition with uh, the dollar or de-dollarization. I think uh, we should not look at it that way. It's basically completely, we are completely on a different uh, track. Uh, the BRICS summit recently concluded and a symbolic BRICS note uh, was launched during uh, the, the summit. What is RBI thinking on that? There has been some engagement. So there have been some discussion. I mean, this was a proposal by uh, brought forth by you know, one of the members. There is some discussion, but nothing has been decided. But how do you, how do you um, protect national interests, especially with the kind of geopolitical tension we have with China? You see, a single currency has its uh, problems. The advantage which uh, Euro had was that they had, you know, geographically they were, you know, they were a block. They were all adjoining each other. So therefore, there are many challenges in thinking of a, a cross-country currency system. So, as I mentioned, some proposals, some thoughts were shared by one of the members. We had, nothing has been decided. Okay, and my last question to you is uh, that we are in the US and you were at the World Bank IMF annual meetings. Over the past six years, you've been coming to the US at least twice to attend these meetings, 12 meetings. How have how has the impression of India evolved over those past 12 meetings? I think internationally, internationally, India's stature has significantly gone up over these years that you were saying. Today, whatever India does, whatever India says is taken much more seriously than ever before. Indian economy is doing well. It's expected to be the third largest uh, economy in 2027. And the overall opportunities, the business opportunities available in India are also considered to be very bright. International confidence, international investor confidence on India has also risen, you know, has increased substantially. So I think in the global round table today, India has a stronger voice than let's say a few years ago. And who would you attribute this to? I think the credit goes to, you know, the credit goes to every stakeholder in the Indian uh, system, in the Indian uh, economic system, in the Indian political system, in the Indian social system. I mean, it's the government, it is the central bank, it is the other authorities, it's the private sector of India, it is the small businessmen, the MSME sector. You know, I think there is a greater amount of optimism and confidence, even in small businesses, even in micro enterprises, even micro enterprises today are using technology in a big way. Sure. So when I say the people of India, I mean all stakeholders in our economic system have facilitated this. Now, Das, you've been so modest, I was expecting that you would say that the monetary policies and the initiatives taken by the RBI under your regime have contributed to the success, which they have. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure speaking to you. We were in conversation with the Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Shakti Gantadas. Thank you for watching.